Hey everyone, welcome to Day Tripper Television. My name is Ross Chevalier. And I'm Brian Weiss. Thank you for joining us. In this episode, we're going to talk predominantly around the subject of exposure. How to get a great image out of your digital camera. Now, to help you get through this, we know that some of these topics can get kind of technical. So we encourage you to send any questions you might have to questions at dtptv.com. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, a few of the key points that we're going to actually cover today would be obviously exposure, how to expose your image, white versus black and everything in between. We're going to go into the elements that are actually affecting your exposure. What is actually causing your camera to make your picture brighter or darker? We're also going to get into what is a good exposure. Because sometimes we want to get an exposure that is good. Sometimes. sometimes. Probably all the time. We're also going to talk a little bit about situations where what the camera thinks is a good exposure isn't. And how to recognize those situations and what you can do as a photographer to compensate for them. And then Brian's going to take us through a session on something that's incredibly important called EXIF data. Information that's encoded with your digital photograph that helps you learn to be a better photographer and to make better photographs. And We'll close our episode, as we often do, with a section called Tips from the Working Pro. We're going to talk about light meters and how they work and what they're, how they're affected. And then, of course, we'll wrap up our show with a review of the things that we've talked about. So, Brian, why don't you start us off with exposure. Exposure is a very multifaceted thing. There, there are many things involved with exposing your image properly. Um, those three things that are the key factors of exposure would be your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO. Now, Ross was nice enough to coin this expression, the Briangle. Which we will show you. Absolutely. But what it really means is when you affect one setting, you're really affecting all three settings. As you increase your shutter speed, your aperture changes. As you change your aperture, your ISO might have to change. So as you adjust one, the other two adjusting, which is why we like to call it a triangle of exposure. And this is really, really important because Getting the right balance allows us to make the great exposure that makes a great photograph. But we've already used some jargon, and that jargon may not be comfortable for everybody watching. We've used terminology, aperture, shutter speed, ISO. So we think we'd like to start by setting a level of playing field. What do these terms mean? So let's start with aperture. Aperture, I like to start with myself usually when I'm discussing these things because I find it the most difficult thing to understand. There's fractions, there's openings and things like that involved. When you're talking about aperture, I usually like to talk about lenses that light in a lot of light. And as you see with this particular lens right here, this is an 85 millimeter f1.4. Now we've got a graphic that we're going to show you in a moment that's going to explain what a 1.4 aperture is compared to an f22 or anything else like that. But essentially, what we're talking about is this um, ability for a lens to open up its pupil, like your eye, and actually allow more light into the camera's sensor. Now that's the first thing that aperture does, is it actually controls the amount of light getting in and out of your camera. Another thing it does though is something called depth of field. Now depth of field is the amount of your photograph that's acceptably in focus, three-dimensionally, closer and further away. So if I'm taking a picture of a person's face. If I want just their front of their eye in focus, I can choose that. If I want the entire head in focus, that's a much deeper three-dimensionally thing that you're taking a picture of. So you need to change your aperture to allow the entire thing to be in focus. So what you saw in the graphic was a set of numbers and actual photographs of lens openings. And you saw numbers like f1.8 and f22. What does all that mean? The easiest way to think about this is like it's a piece of pie. If one was the whole pie, f1.8 is a smaller fraction of the pie. And as that number goes up to f22, it's that much smaller a piece, letting in less light. Now some folks say, well, that's confusing. You know, if it's less light, why isn't it the lower number? It's easiest to think of it as a fraction. Think back to your public school mathematics is one half bigger than one sixteenth. Yes, it is. It lets in more light. And mathematically, that's exactly where aperture comes from. It's a fractional representation of light transmission through glass 
onto a film plane originally, or now onto a digital sensor. But Aperture is only the first piece of the triangle. One thing you did mention, though, was the slice of pie. I actually always refer to it as a piece of pie. I'd rather have a full pie than a 22nd of a slice of pie. So the more open your aperture is, obviously, the more light can get through, but it's like a whole pie. It's very, very big. Whereas an F22 is a very thin slice. It's a 22nd of a slice of pie. So that's, that's actually pretty important as well. Now, the bri-angle, the second part of the bri-angle would be the shutter speed. Now, the shutter speed is the speed in which a shutter will open and close, exposing your sensor to light. If you're trying to take a picture of something that's moving very quickly, you want your shutter to open and close extremely quickly to stop that motion, freeze it so it looks very still in your photograph. But if you're trying to create motion in your shot, you want a slower shutter speed. Waterfalls, for example, you want a slower shutter speed so that water looks very soft traveling across the sensor. Or if you're trying to take pictures of moving light, fireworks, things like that, you want the, sh the shutter to stay open a little bit longer. And if you look at the graphic we have here, you see that if you're taking a picture of a person walking, say, you don't necessarily need a one thousandth of a second shutter speed. An eightieth of a second is usually fine if you're aiming straight at the person. Funny thing, though, if you're coming from an angle, not looking straight at the person, but more of an angle, your shutter speed's a little bit different. It's one two fiftieth of a second. Now, if you were to look at freeway traffic or tennis serve or something moving very, very quickly, obviously your shutter speed needs to speed up that much more so that you can stop that motion. And that's very key. We look at shutter speed as the mechanism not just to control motion, but also to regulate how much light reaches, in this case of digital cameras, the sensor. And how it does that is through a pair of moving elements. And literally, if it's a long exposure, think of it as like a curtain. The first curtain opens, the window's visible, and then the second curtain closes. In a very, very fast exposure, the second curtain is actually trailing the first. And this is what allows us to control how long the sensor is exposed to light, this combination of two curtains. So if you're in a camera store or you're talking to a photographer, particularly a photographer who loves to unload jargon on you, <laughs> you'll hear a lot about first and second curtain. Really, it's the opening and the closing of the window to the sensor. There's nothing more to it than that. And mathematically, shutter speeds are measured in seconds. Today's digital cameras can shoot as fast as one eight thousandth of a second. That means that the sensor is only exposed to light, any pixel for one eight thousandth of a second. That's pretty incredible. To as long as eight seconds completely automatically. When you actually listen to what a shutter sounds like, and I actually encourage people to try this, if you have a camera in your hand and you can change the shutter speed in your camera, you can really hear a difference in how fast a shutter fires. So either you can take an eight thousandth of a second shutter, which sounds like, or you can slow that shutter speed way down. And I'm just going to show you a one second exposure. And pull it close to your mic so they Yeah, can you hear. might have to do that to hear it better. A one second exposure means where the shutter opens and then closes after that. So a much faster shutter speed once again. You don't really even hear the second shutter move, but a slower shutter speed, you certainly do start to hear that. Opens up, three seconds later in this case, it closes. This is incredibly powerful because what it allows us to do is leverage how long the sensor is exposed to light to control motion. As Brian said, stop a racing car or create a nice blur in a waterfall. There's a third element to the Bry angle, though, and this is called ISO. ISO is the sensitivity of your sensor to light. The higher your ISO, the more sensitive your camera is. You think of it like your skin. The higher your skin sensitivity is, the faster you burn. Hi. Myself as well. Basically, if we go out in the sun for a long period of time, we fry like a little fish, whereas some other people are a little bit less sensitive to light, so they can be out in the sun much longer period of time without having to worry about getting that burn. So if you look at the graphic that we were showing right now, you can see that according to your ISO rating, you can see more in lower light situations. At 100 ISO, your color is much better. Your accuracy of image is much cleaner. You're not getting a lot of digital noise, which is created when, you're, when your sensor works much harder. Your sensor becomes more sensitive to light, therefore it works harder,
generates more heat, and that heat is translated into this pixelation that we call digital noise. So at 100 ISO, daylight, you're getting maximum depth of field, but as the ISO starts to get much higher, 1600 is for very low light, and 6400, I'm able to take a picture of a wolf in the middle of a field at 8 o'clock p.m. with almost no light at all. The idea behind being able to manipulate ISO is new to digital cameras. In the days of film, the film was actually chemically encoded with a specific sensitivity. Back then, it was called ASA, which stood for the American Standard Association. As this became an international standard, it was adopted by ISO, the International Standards Organization, but it meant that whatever role of film we had in the camera, that was the exposure range that we could work with. One leg of our triangle was locked in stone. But now with digital, we can manipulate the ISO on a by photo basis if needs be. From one shot to the next, you can fluctuate your ISO. One minute you're aiming into shadow, you can increase your ISO. The next minute you're right in the bright sunlight, you can decrease your ISO accordingly. Now one of the big and important things to recognize, and Brian mentioned this, the lower the ISO, the more demand for light there is, but the better quality of the image there will be as well. So what we've done is on the graphic you see, Brian has shot two pictures of the same thing, with the same camera, with the same lens. What's different is the ISO. So on the left hand side, we see a zoom element at ISO 100. On the right side, we see a zoomed element at ISO 1600. What do you see? Well, clearly, both are visible. But the 100 has better color and is sharper and has greater contrast. The one at 1600, lesser color, more grain, not quite as good a photograph. The power there is that you can take pictures in variable light. Now, when you're shifting your variables, you're shifting your aperture, your shutter speed ISO, you're doing this on a need basis. For example, if you're taking a picture like I do in, in a wrestling environment where you're in very low light, but there's very fast motion, A, I need to make sure my shutter speed is very quick. But I also have to make sure that I'm not, you know, getting what I don't want in focus. That's the, your aperture again. You don't want to have too shallow of a depth of field if you don't want it. But at the same time, especially for wrestling, I'm really trying to focus on a specific thing, a exactly. face of a person. I don't want to have the back corner of a ring in focus and the person in front of me in focus. So I actually prefer to have a more shallow depth of field for that type of photograph. So if you look at the Briangle uh, graphic that we have up right now, you'll see that in this condition, the aperture is extremely open. An f2.8 aperture is a very, very open aperture. It's like the pupil of your eye opening extremely wide. But I also need to make sure that I have a very fast shutter speed. In this case, a 250th of a second. Again, that's a fraction. It's a very, very fast open and close of your shutter. So to achieve this, what we need to do is we have to make our camera more sensitive to light so that the shutter can be faster. And we do that by the ISO. So ultimately, any of these settings can be changed on the fly from one shot to the next, depending on how your lighting is. And that's where the Briangle trademark comes from. So the idea that we want to get across first is that exposure is how we make an image. When we come back from our break, we're going to take a look at some common exposure settings and then help you decide when you need to shift away from what your meter says. Welcome back to Day Tripper Television. Um, what we're going to talk about right now is actually what constitutes a good exposure or a proper exposure. Essentially, that's up to you to determine. I mean, you could really choose it to be underexposed or overexposed, like we've already mentioned. But what actually makes that proper? Now, for that kind of a thing, we have to go to a little chart. And if you look at the chart that we have coming up right now, you'll see that every picture you take requires a different setting. For example, if you're taking a picture of sand, snow, or anything in really bright sun with a lot of reflected light, the concept is you want to let less light into your camera so it's not really bright. So what we've done in this shot is we shoot at a faster shutter speed. That obviously lets a little bit less light in. But we're also going to close down the aperture of the lens. Again, that's the pupil of your eye. If you step out into the bright sun, you're going to see a lot of light and your pupil's going to open up. 
But if you don't want, or are going to close down, sorry, but if, if you don't want to have that darkened effect, you can keep your pupil open. You just end up with a very, very bright exposure. Your eye goes almost blind. But as we start going into lower light situations like a concert, the interior of a home, taking pictures of kids hanging out at a dinner party or something like that, you want to slow your shutter speed down or open up the aperture a little bit more to let more light in. Now one way we can tell if we have this proper exposure is by looking at a thing in your camera called the histogram. The histogram is actually a useful tool that not a lot of people get a lot of use out of. We have another graphic that we're going to bring up here. It's actually going to show you a picture that's overexposed. You'll notice that over toward the right side of the image, it's getting a really, really long white line. It's peaking, as they say, toward the high end of your exposure. Now, the way a histogram works is your bright is on the right and your dark is on the left. So if you have too far to the left, then your picture is too dark. In this case, it's too far to the right. Therefore, this is indicating that your picture is overexposed. But this is only one thing that we can look at. In our next graphic that we'll bring up, we'll see two other histograms that accelerate or enhance, if you will, what happens when we really overexpose and underexpose. Brian said the histogram we just showed you is overexposed. What it indicates is a lot of white in that. But if we were to look, for example, at the current graphic that we popped up, you'll see two other histograms, one underexposed and one overexposed. And you can tell really quickly which one's which because the underexposed histogram is bashed up against the left edge of the scale. The overexposed shot, the histogram on the right, you can see everything is skewed heavily towards the right-hand edge of the histogram, and in this case, actually jammed up against the right edge. The histogram can give you, at a glance, an indicator of what the sensor is seeing. Now, histograms can also be very useful to us because they'll help us tell when we should be compensating for the light conditions. Now, Brian, one of the things that you've encountered a lot shooting wrestling and that sort of thing is the need to compensate for dark backgrounds. Absolutely. Um, if, you're, if you have a dark background and you want to really emphasize color and detail, sometimes underexposing your photograph is a, is a helpful thing to do. Uh, we have another image that we're going to bring up in a second of a landscape of the harbor front of Toronto, and you'll notice it's very dark. Well, I actually prefer it to be very dark. I, I, I'm more of a, a photographer. I love the dark image. And uh, I find that when your blacks are black, your colors pop a little bit more. And in a photo like this one here, the blue isn't really there. If you look at it with your eye, it's a very dark sky. It was very cloudy. It was very gray. But the way that you're able to expose this, you can actually bring out the bluer colors of the sky. You can make your lights a little bit more natural colors. And you can really get a lot more detail. The idea in choosing to underexpose means you're looking at the whole frame, not just the core subject, not just the focal point that we discussed in episode number one. I want to see what's happening behind the key element of my photograph. In the example that we've got up now, this is one of Brian's photographs from his work with wrestling. You see that the wrestler is beautifully well lit. It's an action photograph. The wrestler's in the air. But note that the background is jet black. And that's what we want. We want proper exposure on the key element, not on the background. If we let the camera just go ahead, the background would have been gray and the wrestler would have been blown out. So this is an example of where we would want to choose to underexpose. Another point on that image is also we don't necessarily always want to use a flash. If I had used flash, there would be a lot of reflected light, a lot of glare, and you'd be getting awkward exposure. So when I'm doing wrestling, when I'm making a wrestling photograph, uh, I don't want to use flash unless I really, really have to. Right. So the image that we'll look at next very quickly, another idea, a great exposure of the wrestler, conveying the emotion, the challenge, the frustration, yet the rest of the image drops out to dark. Brian is intentionally underexposed slightly to get those colors to pop and to get the back correct. Now, we don't just choose to underexpose, we can also choose to overexpose. Just one quick point though, that photo, the guy that was in trouble in the corner ended up winning and that was a championship match. So he is now the champion of the AWF. That's, some, that's got something to do with exposure, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's like, totally important to exposure. Totally just important. <laughs> now, I've got another scenario for you. We're out on Saturday with a student and her son plays hockey for the Aurora Tigers.
and she wanted to get great, pho great photographs of the hockey game. Our light meters will be fooled, just as they would by complete blackness, by complete whiteness. So in this sample image, it's a decent enough photograph, but you'll see that the jerseys look gray. The ice looks gray. There's a reason for this, and we're going to cover that later in the episode, but here I've chosen as the photographer to overexpose. So in the next image that I'll go to, same conditions, same lighting, but I chose to overexpose the photograph, and now the difference we see is that the Aurora player's jersey is bright white, the ice is white, and we've got wonderful detail in the dark uniforms of the new market player. This is how using selective exposure control can really, really help us. The idea is we're going to be able to use these tools to help us get the best exposure. Other interesting examples of where you can over or underexpose would be if you're at the beach and you're taking a picture of your wife down by the water and you notice that the light is reflecting off the water quite a bit and she is a silhouette. If you overexpose your image, you'll actually start to see detail. Another example of that is a bird's nest in a tree. You try and take a picture of this bird's nest, but all you're getting is shadow because the sky is right behind it, turning it to silhouette. Absolutely. Adjust your exposure, and all of a sudden, you're going to actually start to see the details in the bird's nest. You're going to start to see all of that. Now, the sky will get a lot brighter as well, but that's okay. You don't need to worry about the sky so much in this condition, especially if it's a gray sky, and then you end up with proper detail on that nest. Now, one of the questions that folks will ask is, well, how do I know? I mean, I'm just starting out. How do I know where my exposure should be? And there's a brilliant tool that's built into our digital SLR cameras, digital single lens reflex, that allows us to learn. And that's called auto exposure bracketing. Bracketing basically says, I'm not exactly sure what the right exposure is, so I'm going to take some that are over and some that are under, and then I'm going to have lots to choose from so I can pick the best possible image. Well, that's the way we used to do it back in the days of film. It was a manual or very mechanical process with a lot of note taking and light meter readings and all kinds of other stuff. Fortunately, in today's digital cameras, we can actually make this automatic. Coming up shortly on the screen, you'll see a graphic of how you can turn that on. Exposure bracketing is a, is a super helpful tool. And if you look here, for Canon at least, this is a menu from a Canon DSLR. The first line that you see says exposure compensation, AEB, that's auto exposure bracketing. Now, if we look at this and, and you adjust some, some sliders and some, some levers on your camera, you can actually expand it from a single image to, if you look at the next graphic that we actually have, um, this is the exposure bracketing display on its own. And uh, basically, this is showing you brighter on one side, darker on the other. And if you turn your sliders, you can actually all of a sudden now take three pictures. And this third, this, uh, sorry, this additional um, image that we're going to show next shows those three exposures highlighted on the, on the exposure bracket symbol. And one will be one stop darker, one will be right in the middle, and one will be one stop brighter. So that you can actually hold the button down for three pictures, and it, show, it takes these three images at all different exposures. And that's the key thought. You could certainly go to manual mode or use exposure compensation controls on your camera to manually overexpose, to manually underexpose. The beauty of auto exposure bracketing is you can preset, hey, I want to go up one, down one, up one and a half, but down only a half. Measure in third stops, half stops. And in some cameras, even up to seven shots in seven, auto exposure bracketing. Nine mode. shots even. Yep. The idea of using this bracketing gives you the flexibility to make the shot you need and not miss it. Remember, digital sh shots really cost nothing. The card's in the camera. So use the bracketing controls because they can really help you get great shots. But they can also help you do something that's incredibly cool. This is one of my favorite things, and unfortunately this gets overused a lot. This is a technique called HDR photography. HDR stands for high dynamic range, which implies exactly that you have three times the dynamic range because you're taking three or more images and smashing them in together to make one clean image. Now, to understand why you would want to use an HDR, you have to understand one more thing. A human eye is an incredible tool. The human eye can see everything. 
For example, me looking out right now, I'm seeing shadow, I'm seeing highlights, I'm seeing lights, I'm seeing all kinds of different things, but my eye is deciphering what works and what doesn't. Unfortunately, the camera's not quite as good. So cameras may not pick up the shadow detail when there's so much brightness going on. It may not pick up the super highlights. It may not pick up all these things. So if we do the auto exposure bracketing, we take one image that's much darker, one image that's normal, and one image that's really, really bright, we can merge these three images into a single image, and then you're actually going to get a much, much more vivid image, which really will simulate what the human eye sees. And if you look at the image we have up now, this is my cousin's car. It's a shot that I was taking on a very beautiful day. Now, the fact that you see so much cloud detail, that's just because I took three, actually in this case, five images and merged them into a single. So the clouds kind of layered up a little bit more, showed a little bit more cloud, but you can see under the car. You can see the dirt on the tires of the car. You can see every little bit of this image because this is an HDR photo. The idea here in HDR is to take what you've got and leverage it to make a compelling image. Now, we used an example of what's called an aggressive HDR. It doesn't look completely natural. It's punchy, it's enhanced. It's a really, really powerful image. But HDR doesn't have to go this route. You also have the capability where you've got a scene where you want to bring up the shadows, you want to bring down the, the light a little bit, where you can combine three, five, seven, nine images and make a really beautiful image that is not completely obvious that it's been manipulated. And this is called a photorealistic image. Exactly. The idea here, digital photography is different from film. In the world of film, we made the photo and then it went off for processing somewhere. And some black art brought us a photograph back. Today in the world of digital, we make the photograph and we process the photograph. This is where digital really makes a difference. And we use HDR as an example of how exposure controls and exposure flexibility can help you make better photos that are more compelling, more interesting, and that really draw the viewer in. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to take a look at some data that's encoded in your photo called EXIF. Welcome back to Day Tripper Television. This is our exposure episode, and I'm going to ask Brian to take us through something that is an incredible learning tool for photographers called EXIF data. EXIF data. One of the things I do before and after most day trips is I actually help a customer understand how to see what your camera actually did to capture the image. This is visible through the EXIF data. Every time you take a picture with a digital camera, it doesn't matter what camera you have, a cell phone, a point and shoot, a DSLR, it makes no difference. If it's digital, it has the EXIF data buried in there somewhere. Now on the graphic that you're looking at, this is an example of the EXIF data as seen through the software Adobe Lightroom. Basically what you see here is a lot of different information and it's hard to understand unless you know what you're looking for. On the bottom, it's all your exposure information. On the top, it's more personal information. You can name your photograph. You can call it whatever you want to call it. And that's up there as well. It'll tell you who took the photograph, what camera you used to take the photograph, and also the date and time. But most importantly, and what I learned the most from, would be the actual exposure data. And if you look at the next frame that we have, it actually has indicated what is where. So if you look here, we have the shot info at the top, the photographer's information in the middle there. This is one of Obviously, this is Ross's software here. Um, there's a little star rating you can actually give your images as well. You tell it, this is a great picture, this is a four star image, or this is a fantastic photograph, and this is a five star. And if you don't really want to keep it, you can give it a one star and you know, toss it away. The tags are also there for helping call up your images nice and quickly. You can actually punch in hockey, and all of your images of hockey can come up on the screen. At the bottom there was the exposure data. You had the dimensions of the photograph. You had the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, the date and time. All of that information is key. If you want to learn what works and what doesn't, shoot in automatic mode. Look at the pictures Absolutely. that turned out really well. Look at the pictures that didn't turn out really well and compare this EXIF data. 
Now, if you don't know where to find it on your own computer, please send us this, what camera you have or what computer you're using, and we'll reply back pretty quickly with all the proper information. And again, that email address is questions at dtptv.com. EXIF data can help you make better photographs because we don't often remember what our settings were when we took a photograph. Years ago when I was an apprentice to a professional, he used to require me to write down at the time of the shot, the shutter speed, the aperture. I had to notate what type of film it was, what I, ASO, ASA at the time we were shooting, whether we were going to request a push or not. It was very tedious. What your focal length was. Recording all that information, great stuff to learn from, but it was really hard. Not anymore. With our digital cameras, the EXIF data is recorded automatically. And in fact, we're already seeing cameras out that will also include GPS data, where you were when you took the photo. And a lot of the processing software that we have available will even allow us to build maps, you know, as we go on a, a trip or something, that show us where we've been and where the photos were taken. For example, on a Mac computer, you, you can actually map it with iPhoto. It'll literally put a map in front of you where each picture was taken. You can call up your images by where they were taken. It's, it's so much information at your fingertips. It's really important to review. One of the elements that we do at our regular monthly meetings at the New Market Camera Club is Brian leads the photo review. Just as he does with his attendees on his trips, we have monthly submissions, and the first third of our meeting is taken up with going through the images that were sent in by members and we spend the time looking at the EXIF data. Explaining what it means, how it relates to the photograph, and it really does help out quite a bit. Why was this shutter speed chosen? Ah, well it's waves crashing, we wanted to freeze them. Why is the depth of field so big or so shallow? We wanted to call attention, we wanted bokeh, we wanted flexibility. We wanted the ability to understand what we did, why we did it, and then to be able to look at it after the fact, because this worked out really well. How did I do that and how do I do it again? Certainly does help you reproduce the image anytime you want. You learn from these things and you have to build up that database of, of education in your mind. If a customer comes in and says, I've taken all these photographs, um, I don't really know why they're turning out a certain way, the first thing I do is say, well, what was your shutter speed? What was your aperture? What was your ISO? It goes into all these details. And if they don't know where that is, I say, check out the EXIF data. It'll tell you all this information. And the more you review it, the more you build up your own database, and the better your instant recall is while you're actually shooting. In fact, if we bring up the graphic again, let's take a closer look at a couple of those elements. As Brian pointed out, the exposure information is held at the bottom of this particular display. So if you look at the tag marked exposure, we'll see that whatever this image was, it was shot at 1 320th of a second at f4 with a focal length of 115 millimeters at ISO 2500 without even seeing the image. We can learn a lot from this. We're in a low light situation. The ISO is set up fairly high. The photographer, happened to be me, was trying to capture something that was moving. So the shutter speed was reasonably high, 3 20th of a second. You might recall the shutter table speed, or shutter speed table that we placed up earlier. The lens is pretty wide open, indicating I want a freeze action and I'm willing to forego depth of field to get that. Also tells us that there was no flash involved. And in some situations, flash is absolutely verboten in the case of the wrestling photographs that Brian takes. And it will remind us which camera body we were using and which lens we were using at the time the photograph was made. This EXIF data also helps us when we go to process our images. We can use the EXIF information to help us correct for lens distortion, correct for flare, correct for vignetting, because it's already encoded. You don't have to write anything down. It's a brilliant tool. Uh, I think people underestimate the value of XF data. Not a lot of people understand where it is. And if you can figure these things out, and again, like I'm saying, you can start reviewing these, uh, this information yourself, you really will start to make more sense of what works and what doesn't. That's really going to help your photography. So XF is a key component to effective exposure control and effective exposure management. Remember the three elements in the Bry angle, shutter speed, aperture, ISO. The EXIF provides you a record of everything that was taken and now you can use that to remake your image. Now how did we get to that exposure information? Well we got to it 
through the use of metering technology that's built into our camera. Now, Brian, on your camera, you've got multiple metering modes. Absolutely. The metering modes are important. Um, basically, you can look at a single point, you can look at multiple points, or you can look at a small cluster of points. Now, what we're actually looking for is how bright or how dark that subject is. If I'm, taking a I'm making a photograph of you, you have a dark shirt, you have lighter hair, and if I wanted to meter and have my picture too bright, if I meter to the dark, the camera will make everything brighter. If I meter to the bright, the camera will make everything darker. Exactly. So by looking at a certain thing and metering to a certain thing, it's really going to influence the overall exposure of your shot. And this is very key because the, what's happening in the light meter is the light meter is actually looking at the whole scene and it's trying to achieve a goal. The goal it's trying to achieve is, you've heard, as 18% gray. You may have heard talk of gray cards or gray references. In fact, I don't know how well you folks can see it, but sitting here at this table, wouldn't you say it's pretty much 18% gray? I would say it's almost 18% exactly, maybe even 12. And so the idea behind 18% gray is it allows the camera to get a good overall average exposure. Now, is everything 18% gray? Well, the answer is it's not. But recognize that our camera is always trying to take whatever scene we have and make it this color, the average exposure. So just as we saw in the wrestling photographs, the background was much darker than this. So our light meters can be fooled. In the hockey photos, we saw a very bright background, the ice. Our cameras can be fooled. So what we want to do is leverage the power of the built-in meter, but also know when to override that meter. Interesting point on that. If you're taking a picture of hockey, there's a lot of white ice. Now, one thing that you have to learn about your camera is it doesn't know what color is. A camera has no clue what color is. A camera only knows different shades of gray. So if it's looking at white, it sees that as 18% gray with film, 12% gray with digital. Now, that's why if you ever take a picture of a ski slope and lots of snow all over the place, it looks gray a lot of the time. Right. So by metering accurately, you all of a sudden go from gray snow to true white snow. Now a question that folks will ask, well, if you're telling us all these things that can go wrong, when is the meter right? The <laughs> meter is right most of the time. Your meter is set to 18% gray for a reason. Photography's been around for over 100 years, and what we've learned is that that's really the middle tone of most images. Now, it comes as gray from black and white for the reason that Brian says. The camera doesn't know what you're taking a photograph of. It doesn't know what the colors are. And they all render into particular tones. You may recall, if you saw episode one, the bare sensor that had sensors for green, for red, and for blue, the three colors of light. We meter for those colors, and we want to make an exposure that best fits. And fortunately, the meter that's built into your digital single lens reflex is going to be right most of the time. But we wanted to spend a little time up front before we get into a section on how to use your meter effectively to understand where the barriers are. Absolutely. And again, they are barriers. And you really made a good point as well. A camera should meter pretty accurately. Uh, the better the camera, obviously, the better the metering. And sometimes if you're taking pictures and they're just coming out all exposed poorly, there may actually be a problem with your camera's metering. Could happen. It does happen. They are electronics. However, if you use your camera properly, even in automatic modes, they generally tend to work quite well. So when we talk about metering, we're also going to take a look at how we measure metering. Do we meter off a center spot? Do we do average metering? Do we do center weight? These different metering modes are built into your camera, and there is no really simple way to show it in terms of a graphic. But every digital SLR is going to have meter pattern settings. The meter pattern setting that you choose will be very dependent on the subject. So if, for example, you were at a hockey game and you wanted to get the right exposure off of the skater, or you're at a wrestling match, and you wanted the right exposure off the wrestler. By using a center or spot meter, we get an accurate reading from that person. Off a very single small point. But what happens if you've got 
a big landscape. What type of metering do you use then? Well, you can use all different kinds of metering. You can use matrix metering. You can use evaluative metering. Uh, they all have different names, and essentially what that means is evaluative is looking at the entire image and giving you an average of everything. It's not looking at a specific thing. It's not looking here. It's looking everywhere and averaging everything, which is why you tend to get a lot of shadows and under the trees, and you tend to get you know, a very bright sky. So if you meter accurately, all of a sudden the shadows are a little bit nicer. You notice the sky isn't quite as bright. It really depends on what you're metering against. Fortunately, we've got great meters in our cameras, so we're going to be able to do that. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of the means that we can use to make the best possible meter reading. Welcome back. Thanks again for watching Day Tripper Television. We hope you're really getting a lot out of this. I know we're having a great time doing it. We're going to have our, our segment right now on tips from the working professional. In this case, we're actually going to be talking with Ross. Hi. How Ross, you doing? Ross shoots a lot. Uh, he's an excellent instructor and he's a phenomenal photographer. Um, and he's also very good as far as the technical side of photography goes, as you, I'm sure you've all noticed so far. Now, w the reason why I say that's important is when you're doing technical information, there's nothing more technical than metering properly, using oh, color, nice. using um, the way light hits the surface and the, the reflected light coming off that surface. So what we're going to talk about first is actually understanding your light meter and what it's actually doing. So for that, Ross, maybe you can lead us in and, and explain sure. that a little bit. So before the break, we talked about your light meter working to achieve what we call 18% gray. I carry this with me everywhere. This is called a color checker passport. It is a product, but I'm very dependent on it. And what you see at the center of this particular screen is an 18% gray card. The value proposition to a gray card is that we can then meter off it if we didn't have a good gray tone to meter from. Perhaps everything was too bright. Perhaps everything was too dark. The use of carrying the gray card allows us to choose a metering source. And through the choice of spot metering or tools like that within our cameras, we can do this. This is a great tool to have. And back in the days of film, we actually kind of weren't let out in the field without a gray card. Because the type of metering that we do in our cameras is called reflected metering. Now we'll talk a little bit more about different types of meter, but having that gray card allows the camera to match exactly what it's trying to do. So, here we're under lights in the studio. A camera will measure the light reflected from this gray card and construct a proper exposure. It won't look at me. It won't look at my, the, my dark shirt or Brian's dark shirt or our light colored skin. We're going to get a proper exposure. It shouldn't be a giant secret, but a lot of times it is. I'm going to flip the card around and we're going to take a look at a scale, sometimes called the zone scale the tone scale, or how about black to white? Black to white. So on the other side of our color checker passport, right here on the top line, we'll see a range from pure white to pure black. In that range, we can count, in this case, six squares. The reason that there are six squares is, well, you said it earlier. Our eyes are better than any camera. And when the eye is better than the camera, the eye sees more tonal range. Even the best digital single lens reflex cameras only see five or six tonal ranges. So what we want to do in getting a great exposure is we want to get great blacks. We want to get great whites. And the way that we do that is we skew by metering on 18% gray the second square that we saw back here. This allows us to control the right range of light. So if my camera has six possible tonal ranges that it can record, and macroscopically that would be correct because many di digital single lens reflex cameras are 8-bit devices, I want to make sure I'm getting them all. So if I set my meter reading here for 18%, this is what my camera is going to do for me automatically. I'm going to get 
white whites and black blacks and a nice tonal range in between. Which is exactly what we're hoping for. You don't want to have your blacks predominant. You don't want to have too, too much white. You don't want to have it gray when it's supposed to be white. You want your color to be as accurate as possible. Now, what is the meter actually trying to tell you? Like, when you're using a meter, we talk meter this, meter that, but what's it really trying to tell you? All the meter is telling us is what it sees in terms of light available to make an exposure, but remember, it's making that correction that says, I've been pre-programmed to say, take an average of what I'm seeing and set an exposure for 18% gray. Okay. Now, what if I were to give you an example? Please. I said earlier the example of a landscape shot. I run a lot of day trips to Algonquin Park. We have all of our clients lined up on the surface. They're doing a landscape picture of the sunset or the sunrise. Most of these shots come out very, very dark at the bottom and very, very bright at the top. Now, what would the proper way of getting exposure accurate so that you can see the shadow detail at the bottom and still get the sky in focus? What's a, a really good option for that? Not to oversimplify, but the easiest way to do that is actually to use either an incident light meter or to take a reflected light meter reading off a gray card. Because you're right, the sky is going to fool the meter. The dark ground is going to fool the meter. We see it in the fall shots. Remember the foliage? Everybody's looking for this popping color, mm -hmm. and they didn't get it because Very the skies flat. were too bright and the ground was too dark. So meter off a gray card if we're metering through the camera lens, or we can go to a different kind of technology called the light meter. Now, this is an external device. The big dome tells us that this is an incident light meter. And an incident light meter doesn't measure reflected light, it measures the light that's actually striking the sensor. Incident light meters are typically used in studio applications and by anybody who wants to get a really great shot in that really difficult situation where I've got a lot of light subjects and a lot of dark subjects, I want to know what the light is that's falling on them. So with my incident light meter, I can take a meter reading and get the right light. There's another way that I can do that too. This particular meter also offers the capability to do spot metering and you can see a little lens looking down the barrel here. This allows us to point at varying subjects within our, t our scene. A specific spot. A specific spot. Look for the black areas, take a meter reading. Look at the bright areas, the white areas, take a meter reading. If it's more than six stops, we know that we're going to have to sacrifice something because we know the limitation of the camera. It's actually a really good point. We'll have to sacrifice something. Sometimes it just doesn't work. It will happen. We've all taken photographs Absolutely. that just, there's just no way you can expose properly. And for somebody to expect that every single photo you ever make is going to be perfect, it's a little bit unrealistic. Professional photographers get what, 20%? On Maybe. their best day. On we'll their say best three day. Three to five is a great day. Absolutely. And that's the point that I really, really want to stress. We can go out, make photographs all day long, come home with 3,000 images, and maybe get 30 to 50 that we love. So don't beat yourself up too much if you're not getting it right away. Now, here's your exercise for the photo contest, our theme for this episode. Go out and make images, but go out and make the same image at different exposures. Try auto exposure bracketing that we talked about earlier today. Try metering off different areas. By metering off the light, we're going to skew the darks. By metering off the dark, we're going to skew the lights. Take the same shot, but take it at different exposures. Read the EXIF data so you know what you did when you look at it afterwards, and that's going to help tell you what settings made the right decision for that particular scene. What's our goal? Help you be a better photographer and help you make better photographs. Apply the things that we talked about. Understanding exposure, understanding EXIF and where to find it, using your light meter effectively, maybe even pick yourself up a gray card, something to carry with you in your camera bag so you have the tools to go make these great exposures. You just said something. Camera bag. Yeah. Camera bag. Believe it or not, a lot of camera bags are more than just a bag. Low Pro, for example, they make their camera bags with the interior 18% gray. So you can actually pull out one of those little sections that you have in your camera bag and meter off of that. And that's actually going to give you a very, very accurate meter as well. 
hey, you know what, that's exactly right, and then you didn't have to go out and spend a cent on a great card. Not that they're horribly expensive, but many of these top-line bags will have that proper 18% gray lining. We want to thank you very much for watching this episode. We want to see you again for our next one, and we're going to have a really cool topic next. What is it? Well, the next topic is actually going to be on lenses. But lenses are, you know, there's so much to cover, so hopefully we'll be able to get to everything for sure. See you again soon.